Sup! Penguin Truth here, and it's time for a very choice clutch episode of Otaku Evolution. Radical. This here's the big time debut of a wailing wizard new theme month, 80s month. Now, Natch, I've been giving you the 411 of both the Primo and the Bogus from that decadent decade for the long haul, but I'm stoked to present three titles in a row from the RC Cola chugging jelly shoe wearing, mullet styling era that brought us the Goonies, Fraggle Rock, and the inexplicable career of Dave Coulier. I might have mentioned in years past that this was a pivotal time for anime production. With widespread use of the VCR, and still riding high on the economic bubble, Japanese animation companies were comfortable with being bold, experimental, and in some cases, dangerously extravagant with certain productions. These were the years that saw the rise of the anime direct market in the original video animation or OVA. They're like our own direct-to-video features, except without the embarrassing stigma. Some of these features were short standalones, and some of them were multiple episodes long. I mean, Legend of the Galactic Heroes was 110 episodes long, and that's just the main body. I've covered some of the most famous OVAs of the time, like Area 88, Bubblegum Crisis, and Pat Labor. I also once covered the first part of Megazone 2-3, a series of features put out by the likes of Noboru Ichiguro, Ichiro Watano, and Shinji Aramaki. They each directed a part of the OVA, though the third part is really two parts, but whatever. The first two parts were written by industry veteran Hiroyuki Hoshiyama, and featured music by Japanese pop singer Kumi Miyasato, who plays Eve. In part one, main character Shogo Yahagi comes into possession of a motorcycle that can turn into a giant robot called the Garland and can communicate with a supercomputer called Bahamut and its AI Eve. He had always just been your typical teen, hanging out with friends, trying to woo a girl named Yui, working at a Mickey D's, getting his friend killed because he let her film his classified military equipment and the horrible truth that they've all been living in a giant spaceship and Earth's real civilizations were long ago destroyed? You know, your typical teenager problems. But my last stepped our hero, he just got his ass handed to him by military officer BD, and barely escaped with his life. The military has taken control of everything they can on the ship, and used it to battle with the other ship carrying humanity's remains. However, the military still can't get to certain parts of the Bahamut database, and it's testing BD's patience. Wait, is that BD? Where's Shogo? Wait, that's Shogo? Dude had brown anime hair and... Is that Yui? She had teal hair! Eve, help! I... Well, she didn't change much. And still played in the English dub by one of my favorite voice actors, Monica Rial. Whereas Shogo is still played by... Oh. Oh... Oh no. Please, Elephant, I'm not here to talk about that. Just... Just let me review this anime. I, I just... I just want to review this anime. Yes, I know, Babar can be seen as pro-colonialism and imperialism, Elephant. Though I'm surprised you picked up on that. After all... You are the symbol of the Republican Party. <coughs> yes, that was the one political joke of the year. Maybe. The difference in character designs is palpable. Part 1's designs were done by Haruhiko Mikimoto and Toshihiro Hirano, in a broader, more stereotypical style for 80s mecha anime. But Yasuomi Umetsu's designs in Part 2 have some of our characters looking like they stepped out of a seinen drama or sci-fi horror anime. I don't know, I can't quite put my finger on it. The faces and hair seem to be more detailed, and it gives the whole thing a veneer of having graduated or upgraded in tone. Like you should be taking it more seriously than the first part. I'm not sure which part's character designs I prefer, 
but I think you'll find it's basically the same in content, just pushed a little further. There's still an all-encompassing government conspiracy to keep the masses ignorant that their Tokyo was a city within a giant spaceship. The government and military is still trying to access all of Bahamut's systems as to better fight their rival ship. I don't remember them mentioning that diplomacy had been tried. Shogo's on the lam, Tomimi's murder pinned on him, and has to rely on his biker gang. And, uh, you know, transforming motorcycle robot. For protection. Honestly, though? Space battles and mecha combat take a backseat to the real meat of the film. The gang just fucking around and being rebellious punks. You'd think this would have become grating, as it can stall the main plot, but I honestly like these scenes the most. I sense a real camaraderie among the members of, uh, Trash. Yeah, the gang's called Trash. They even have a giant biker wench named Dump. Dump is pretty cool, I like Dump. She doesn't have a lot of lines, but she makes an impression. Shogo's second in command seems to be this guy Lightning, who's really fond of Eve, though he's ostensibly in a relationship with Harley Quinn here. Why do I call her that? Listen to the dub and you'll understand. Lightning is a gutsy bastard, even practically sacrificing himself to go back for members lagging behind in the final fight. Out of combat, he's really outspoken and acts as the life of the party, especially compared to Shogo's now distant nature. But at least our hero still knows how to lay pipe, because just like in the first part, we get another completely gratuitous sex scene. On the other hand, maybe it's a bit problematic. I mean, look at this guy. At first, he's just... Forcing a kiss on her... Shut up, I know! Uh, uh, uh let's see, uh, how to distract from that. Oh, oh, look, look, nightmarish violence! There you go! Good old-fashioned 1980s anime ultraviolence. Ooh, look, those violating ten... I mean, Cables took out that officer with the weird face. Oof, that's nasty. And that's not the only carnage you see in this. Just look at the Space Tokyo getting wrecked when Eve pulls the ejection chute lever and jettisons the remainders of the ship's occupants. But I know, spoiler. And hey, look, it's Gen on Tower from Bubblegum Crisis. This anime persists in being the essence of the 1980s, with the hairstyles, tacky color schemes, biker punk element, 80s pop music, the transforming robots, a little bit of that 80s fear over nuclear destruction. All this needed was a ruthless capitalist hegemony, and the government leaders seemed to have the same aesthetics as the 80s corporate bastards. Let's face it, they're mostly the same type of person. We even have a typical moody, but somehow popular, male lead, complete with totally superficial romance with the girl who all we know about is... she's kind of a thrill seeker, I guess? Shogo's gone from positive, if a bit awkward, teen boy, to brooding adults are the enemy, tomino -ish character. And that's fine, it makes sense with what he's been through, but I don't know if I care if this couple makes it or not. I find myself more entertained with the stock, but still much more charming periphery characters, who at least have a lot of presence if not development or depth. Other than Shogo, Yui, and Eve, the only returning character is BD, and we still don't know what he's all about, aside from wanting to obtain better weapons. There's this weird swerve at the end when a super weapon on the moon is about to obliterate the generation ships. It makes sense in context. 
Where first BD acts all tough and basically calls Shogo a punk-ass kid, but then suddenly starts giving him life advice about never giving up, basically wishing him luck, and then disappearing, never to be seen again. Did he just get killed like everybody else? I know Eve was protecting Shogo's bunch because he proved to be a good friend in person, but you'd think she would have preserved a few more people. The loss of lives was catastrophic. Oh, well, that's 80s anime for you. Singing a pop song over the deaths of thousands of people. Hmm, come to think of it, that hasn't really changed much. Hmm, well, this was a short one, huh? I mean, there's not a lot about this one that I didn't already say about the first one. A fun and ridiculous feature with just a little bit of think meat on the nature of perceived reality. But once the cat was out of the bag in the first part... You really couldn't expect the fans to be as taken with knowing something they already knew. That's probably why this part leaned on the action. And the gang. And that's cool, they're a lot of fun. Let's make a toast! Toast to what? Who cares as long as we got something to toast with? Then chug it! Chug it! That's it for this week's episode of Otaku Evolution. Join me in our next one where I'll be returning to that boss bandit, that mono marauder, that primo plunderer, that stellar stealer, Loop on the Third. Too bad the movie will be kind of bogus. But not boring. Until then, see ya! I'm just glad that someone cares about me and my friends. And that I could meet you. Thank you, Eve. Thank you. Thank you, Shogo. Please don't let go of the hope in your hearts. I will do everything I can for you. <laughs>